This is the More to the Story podcast with Dr. Andy Miller. We hope you guys enjoyed today's conversation. Welcome to the More to the Story podcast with Andy Miller. I serve as the Vice President for Academic Affairs at Wesley Biblical Seminary and Professor of Historical Theology. And I'm so excited that you've been able to come along on today's podcast. This is a special kind of edition. I, I changed my schedule to accommodate this episode because I had an opportunity to bring together a couple of scholars who've been influenced by a person who was just recently promoted to glory, and that's Dr. Billy Abraham, who served on my doctoral committee at SMU Perkins School of Theology. So uh, he was a, a huge figure in the Wesleyan evangelical movement and somebody who made a great impression on me. And here's what I want you to do. Like, if you've never heard of him, I encourage you to just look him up, maybe even uh, YouTube him or Google him, find some articles he's written, or he has some great presentations on YouTube. He has a wonderful, uh, like a short book, kind of an intro book that I recommend to people it is a book written in the mid nineties called Waking Up from Doctrinal Amnesia. We mentioned several other books in it, in this podcast, and I have a few friends who also study with him, people who, who in, were closer to him and more aware of his influence. And so we worked through this in the, on that podcast, but I think you'll see in this podcast, not just something where we're just talking about somebody who's a great influence on us, but the type of Christians and leaders and mentors we are all called to be. So I hope you'll enjoy today's podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Wesley Biblical Seminary. We have a whole range of degree programs and options for people who are trying to become trusted leaders who serve faithful churches. And that means it's not just for people training to become pastors. It's for lay people as well. We have a variety of programs. So if you go to wbs.edu, you'll find how we're helping people become trusted leaders for faithful churches. Now, in addition to that, we also have another sponsor, and that is William Roberts, who is a financial planner. He's a pastor's kid who's somebody who understands, particularly people serving in ministry, how he can help them achieve their financial goals. You can go to williamhroberts.com and find out how he can serve you. He also you know, is particularly gifted with helping people who serve in the Salvation Army, employees and officers in the Salvation Army who are trying to plan for the future and with those unique situations dealing with parsonages and quarters and how people are compensated. So check Bill out. And we're really thankful to have him as a sponsor. Interesting enough, Bill is really involved with Baylor University. His kids go there, and that's where uh, Dr. Billy Abraham last served. Um, kind of in his retirement, he was starting a new initiative at Baylor University just before he was promoted to glory a few weeks ago. It was really a gut punch to many of us in the Wesleyan theological tradition as we saw him as kind of like the champion of this movement intellectually. But you'll get a little bit of that on today's podcast as we admire and thank God for the influence of Dr. Billy Abraham. Thanks for checking out the More to This Story podcast. God bless you. Well, welcome to the More to the Story podcast. Today is a special episode. It's distinct and one that I didn't have planned, but in light of a mentor and friend being promoted to glory, and that's language I use from the Salvation Army, um, I've, I felt like it would be helpful for my audience to get a sense of the life and ministry and scholarship of Dr. Billy Abraham, who just less than two weeks ago went to be with Jesus, and we're thankful for his life. And so I brought on uh, some friends, some friends that are new to me, but people who were connected intimately to Billy's life. They were his students, they were his peers, and people who maybe even under, certainly understand his life and influence better than me. So I'm going to just go around and I'll introduce each of them. They are Dr. Jason Victors, Dr. David Watson, Dr. Justice Hunter. Um, Drs. Watson and Hunter both teach at United Theological Seminary and Jason teaches at Asbury Theological Seminary. They were all students at Southern Methodist University and did PhDs there. And um, not all of them were directly under the advi advisory of um, well, what's the right word there? They weren't under the exact tutelage and their dissertations of Billy Abraham, but some of them were. So I'm interested to hear more about this. So I want to just go around and if you guys would just tell us the way that you interacted with Dr. Abraham and what his influence was on your life. And then we'll get into some specifics of his work. So Jason, would you start us off? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was on my way to I thought I was on my way to, to, to do doctoral work at, at Princeton, um, and Bruce McCormack was actually the person that, that sent me down to Dallas to 
talked to Billy, uh, I, I didn't know who Billy was um, and had never read anything by him. Interesting. Uh, he just thought that my my interests lined up better with Billy's than his own. And so I uh, left New Jersey and went to Dallas and uh, met and, and Billy was incredibly gracious, you know, welcomed me in his office. We talked for a couple of hours by the time I was done. Uh, I realized Bruce was right that that there was a lot of alignment in our interests, and uh, Billy had just published Canon and Criterion in Christian okay. Theology, uh, and so um, I went back and and read that and uh, was more convinced than ever, and then uh, went to SMU and did my work under him uh, in systematic theology. Uh, served as his assistant, assistant to the outward chair for a couple of years while I was there, uh, which meant co-teaching some stuff with him, mainly in Houston, a little bit in Dallas uh, at, at Perkins Houston Extension. Um, I could go on uh, in terms of just personal relationship after the dissertation. We we became pretty close friends, um, and uh, he officiated at both my wedding and my son's baptism. Ah, uh, awesome. So, and then we we just have we did several book projects and things together over the years, and uh, so he's he's a dear friend. Yeah, awesome. Justice, how about you? Uh, similarly, I was I met Billy through SMU as a, as a doctoral student. I actually I actually went to SMU to write with Bruce Marshall, um, who's a, who's a eminent Catholic theologian who worked in medieval scholasticism, which is what I was really interested in. Uh, but the thing that was really attractive to me about SMU was that you had Bruce there in that tradition, and then then you had uh, who who was, in my opinion, and remains in my opinion, the pre, the preeminent Methodist theologian. Um, and Billy. And so those two, you know, they just sort of put me through my paces <laughs> over over four years there and, and, uh, and, you know, have continued that anytime you see Billy, af see, see Billy after going through that type of training, it's just sort of you just jump right back into, you know, fighting tooth and nail for your position and, and enjoying <laughs> everything all along. So um, we've, we've done, we've just kind of continued that friendship and, and mentorship. Um, along from that point yeah this is probably 2011 is when i started in the doctoral program so, so, so about 10 years i got to enjoy uh, a close yeah. relationship with Billy. so with you and jason both to get now interesting about your stories i may be wrong but neither of you came from a united methodist background like uh growing up at least right maybe you were uh i think jason were you nazarene and justice you're free methodist then you became united methodist now justice you're a catholic i mean so there's an interesting like little movement here but uh what did he was he in part what drew you when you I'm not sure where Jason you are these days uh it, to, toward Methodism uh, like United Methodism in that sense yeah it's a good question uh, I'm not sure where I'm at either um, <laughs> me either <laughs> um so yeah I was sort of in between uh the holiness movement and Methodism growing up um, yeah kind of the deep background on my mom's side was was Methodist uh, and the deep background on my father's side was actually Wesley and holiness uh, the Wesleyan okay. denomination yeah and um, and then I kind of followed a girl to a Nazarene college out of high okay. school so it was very noble high mind <laughs> kind of stuff um, and that's how I, I fell in for a season with the Nazarenes uh, I was uh, following their women around and um, <laughs> But it's just a joke, of course. Um, no, and and then by the time I got to Dallas, I I, I had figured out that uh, there were some aspects of Nazarene culture, for lack of a better term, that that I didn't think were going to work for me long term. And then Billy, I think, sort of was he's he's always been eager to recruit people to Methodism, and um, so he made that pretty easy uh, for me. Uh, but I do want to add one quick footnote and just say that that one of the things I we get into this later, I'm sure yeah, one yeah. Of the things I most about him was that just, you know, he, he sort of embodied uh, ecumenicity. Yes, he, yes, yes. He really um, never met uh, a person, regardless of the branch of the Christian family, you know, the, the Christian religion Aye. that he came out of that he didn't, he wasn't able to sit down and talk with. Uh, and we could say more about that, but I Bye. really just instilled a love in, in everybody that knew him for things like Eastern Orthodoxy, Catholicism, but he's just so generous. I mean, that's Bye. so in my own tradition, like, so I, I brought that up because I felt like 
kind of like holiness movement denominations, like it, it, I'm part of the Salvation Army, most of my audience would know that. But in that, that church, what I found was I found Billy helping me see the greater ecumenical tradition, or like uh, Eastern Orthodoxy. But at the same time, he loved the Salvation Army. And you you see him interacting in the logic of evangelism. He, and, you know, some of it, he would press me on it. He would sometimes act like I wasn't a Christian because I wasn't baptized. But beyond that, you know, we, and maybe you guys feel that way too. I don't know. But uh, so we, we would we would have these great, great, comfort, but he loved the kind of like brass band type of get in gritty sort of stuff. <laughs> and he called me Mr. Salvation Army. You know, so I, I would come in in uniform. So, okay, just I don't, I don't mean to take us down that tr track too. I mean, is, is that fair? What I was saying, like kind of like this ecumenical. You want to add anything? And I'll get to you in a second here, David. Sorry. Yeah, I think I, I think when I came when I met Billy, I was kind of I was he was friendly to where I was at on those types of questions. If that makes sense, yeah. he was he was interested in. Um, I, I became actually I became United Methodist thanks to David Watson. Oh, there you go. Uh, part, I'd, I'd grown up, well, thanks to two things. I, I moved to the University of Dayton, and there are no free Methodist churches in Dayton, Ohio. And um, and so then, you know, I thought, well, I'll, maybe I'll go back upstream. My grandparents were were, um, were United Methodist. Free Methodism was just a one one uh, generation experiment in the in the Hunter like Hunter and Hamilton legacy that my parents are from. They were both United Methodists when they met. So anyway, I went, so I landed back in the United Methodism at David's church because I was a doctoral student here or not a master student at the University of Dayton. And, and I connected with David and Jason. I don't know how I connected with you guys somehow because Jason was at United at the time. Yeah. But I do think that, you know, to be impacted by David Watson and Jason Vickers is to be impacted by Billy Abraham, you know, <laughs> uh, secondary, secondary causes as the time. <laughs> Which just for the record, if, if I'm not if David I'm not Watson. mistaken, okay. if I'm not mistaken, Justice, I think we met at Dayton University, of Dayton. I think when Griffiths, Paul Griffiths, and Marshall were doing something there that Levering put together. It, that sounds that right. Sound? I think that's when I met you the first. Met Matthew time. Levering was the source. Yep, the connection. Yep. So anyway, but I met Billy, he was very sympathetic. I had been a student at Asbury Theological Seminary right. and um, I was interested in, I went in interested in Karl Barth. Um, um, my judgment improved and I got less interested in Barth and more interested <laughs> in the early Christianity. And yeah. uh, so, but by the time I finished there, I didn't know how to go about studying early Christianity. So I just applied to a bunch of Catholic schools and that's what led me to the University of Dayton. So already I had this, you know, interest in kind of, um and and growing sense of the need to ground that kind of evangelical christian tradition i was grown in which is sort of a generic right. evangelical christianity in deeper wells and that was that's what i was looking for and billy was really helpful in helping helping me think through what that would look like um and how to how to conceive that yeah beautiful all right david sorry to keep you keep waiting here the my third guest here no, no david watson and you're a New Testament scholar, so you wouldn't necessarily think, oh, okay, that would mean you'd work with Billy Abraham at SMU, but obviously you did, and you did some unique work together. You know, it, it's interesting. Um, you know, Billy got me interested in epistemology, so yeah. kind of the study of how you know what you know. And, and I'll never be an expert in epistemology. I know enough to be dangerous or anything like that, but I, I was... I was speaking to um, a very, I won't say who, but a really well-known, renowned biblical scholar at one time. And and um, he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, right now I'm taking a course in epistemology. And he looked at me and he said, well, you'll probably be a terrible biblical scholar. <laughs> and, and I think what he meant was, once you start digging underneath the presuppositions of your guild, uh, it kind of messes you up. And that sort of did happen for me that oh. a lot of sort of the presuppositions in biblical studies, um, especially at that time period, kind of late 90s, early 2000s, you know, just they didn't seem right to me. And so I was always questioning these things. I probably drove everyone crazy, actually. I was studying with a very fine biblical scholar, Joette Bassler. I got a great education from her. Um, but, but actually I, I met Billy way before then, um, 
I probably was 23 years old. I was in his evangelism course and um, I just, I had just come straight out of my undergraduate degree. And so, you know, I'd taken some courses like in, in Bible, I went to Texas Tech University, but if you take Bible courses at a, at a state school, you know, they, they really can be, again, these epistemological questions and metaphysical questions that you're not sophisticated enough to think through, at least I wasn't sophisticated enough to think through when right. I was 21, 22 years old, you know, they can actually be very damaging to your faith if they're not framed in the right way. Right. And so I, I was kind of, I came into seminary kind of under the impression that sort of historical Christianity was outdated, outmoded, and not intellectually responsible. And wow. Billy disabused me of that notion <laughs> quite forcefully, actually. <laughs> and then, you know, over a number of years, just in conversations with him really taught me to love the faith of the church. Right. He, he was very patient and he would, um, Billy all, here's the thing about Billy. He was one of the most optimistic people I've ever met in my life. And he believed that there was no one, no one that he could not win over to his position given enough time. And with me, he certainly did do that in a number of ways. Yeah. It's beautiful. You know, it, he, he would do this, by I think like the, the the bit I picked up from him is like he could argue somebody else's position better than they could, <laughs> and he was so he was so in, in part like watching him on the campus at Perkins, it was a delight to see the way his colleagues who didn't share the same theology as him would it would just loved him and how he could you know tried to win them. It's like he was put just in the perfect environment. I'd love to hear about some of our, your stories about um, uh, being, being in debate with him. <laughs> I'm sure there's something like, it, it, David, what, what, do you have some uh, funny story about that? <laughs> or, I mean, I, I thought, you know, like when you're young, you try on a lot of different theological positions and see how they fit. You're trying on ideas and that. And I, I remember going to dinner with him one time and I told him I was going to become an open theist. And then it was on. It was like um it was like the the battle of the bulge, but but the battle was entirely one sided. And and he he just completely um I'll just say he was quite convincing and compelling in his uh, position that I should not adopt open theism as a position. And, um, and I'm glad that he did that for me. I mean, Billy, you know, I, as I wrote elsewhere, Billy in his critique, he, he could be devastating uh, and sometimes brutal, but, but I, but I want to qualify the way that I say that. I mean, when he was, when he was debating with someone like me, who clearly was not his intellectual equal, <laughs> he would be very forceful in his um, presentation, but at the same time, he was never mean in his presentation. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, he was not condescending. Um, he didn't speak down to you, but he did present his argument in ways that were undeniably forceful, and I I appreciated that about him. That's a great way to say it. Yeah, Jason. Yeah, I just two quick footnotes to things David has said, um, and I'd almost and I'm a little bit curious maybe to get justice's reaction to the second one especially um the first one david mentioned you know billy uh billy's optimism and i think that's really something worth um saying even more about that it wasn't just about his optimism related to individual persons um be it david or someone else but but optimism about the church, about the future. And he sort of had this irrepressible kind of confidence or faith in the providence of God mm. that you never know. And he'd always say things like, you just never know what will happen, you know, in time. And so you, he refused to give up on, not just on people, but on the church or say Methodism, even though you know, it's so right. tempting to me to 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 give up on it. He he just refused to give up on the church or Methodism or other things. The second footnote for me to David's comments would just be about the open theism bit. Um, here, and this is where I, I'm curious to get Justice's thoughts on this. Um, you know, one of the things I always appreciated about Billy is that 
he, you know, you would, you would think because he had this reputation for being the great champion of orthodoxy or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But there was another sense in which he was always uh, careful to say that, that he considered himself a classical small L liberal. Right, right. And that what this meant was that he was interested in all good arguments. And, and Justice has just written about this, actually. That's why I'm wanting to punt it over to him here. Uh, and, and so I think even for something like Boston personalism way back in the early 20th century in, in the history of Methodist theology, he loved Borden Parker Bound. I mean, he actually read Bound, loved Bound, wrote about Bound in some early work in the Wesleyan Theological Journal. Uh, he, he was, and I think even something like open theism, uh, if you were expecting him just to show up now in, in the, the conversation with David was, was fair, something, you know, very specific, but if you asked him to come and, and, and debate, you know, a committed open theist, you know, he, he was, he was going to be, he was first going to try to find a way to be appreciative or to discover, you know, is there some aspect or, or part of truth here that they've gotten their hands around that, that we need to hear and be amenable to justice? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, as you're talking, I think that's right. I, I remember probably in the past couple of years, a couple of times, Billy and I, uh, him, him, uh, sort of, I think, baiting me um, with his praise, uh, praise of Borden Parker Bound because he knows that I don't didn't care for him uh, much at all, um, <laughs> and and you know, I, I, in fact, I I remember him sort of at one point saying, just sort of grinning at me, saying, you know, William Burt Pope is interesting, but who's a really really innovative thinker would be that board and Parker bound, you know, uh, just, just, to, just to kind of get under my skin and see what I, how I'd react. Um, I think with Billy, you know, these types of reflections make me ask, you know, what's, what's the real, what was the real core of this man? You know, I think, um, he, he has, he had this incredible intellectual gift. Um, it was an incredible instrument, but he deployed it in a way that was always in service to his commitment to the gospel. And so, you know, if David is someone who he's taken under his two religion is becoming, you know, um, um, attracted to open theism, as we all probably were at some point in seminary. I know, you know, I, I was, you know, it's flavor of the week, you know, when I was in <laughs> seminary, whatever I pulled off the shelf. But, um, you know, in that situation, Billy's going to, he's going to, he's, he was a, wise spiritual guide he's going to club that out of you if you need it clubbed out of you you know but if but if he's engaging a, you know someone who spent a long lifetime of reflection on this question and then and it's made this sort of decided commitment to it well he's going to engage you differently um yeah. he can't speak that way to you but he's still going to try to draw you in uh to the fullness of of the, the christian vision of reality which i think at the end of the day billy did not think open theism um was able to manage, nor did he think Borden Parker Bound could, I, I don't think actually, because usually what he argued was that he had captured the spirit of, of Wesleyan piety um, that drove his seriously flawed philosophical ideas. <laughs> so I think that's really, that's really unique. You don't encounter the mind that, that, that works like that. You guys think that's right? I do think, I think it's right, Justice. And I also, I also though want to highlight how fierce he could be in defense of the faith once and for all entrusted to the saints. Yeah, I, I've seen a couple of different times when scholars came in either for talks or colloquy who were really actually um, hostile, openly hostile to attempting to subvert Orthodox Christianity. And um, he would he would come after them using all of his intellectual powers. Um, you know, I, I saw him and Bruce Marshall one time um, go after a philosopher whom I won't name, but uh, it, it was it was brutal to behold. I mean, it was quite something. By the, by the way, Andy, uh, this is what this is what happens when you become a dean. Andy is you you can't name names anymore. Right? <laughs> I know there you go. Justice no. and I are free. We'll just name yeah. names yeah. all day. Yeah. You know, no way. But, yeah, that's right. No way. <laughs> I, one of Billy's favorite phrases, I've heard him say it, you know, a hundred times, he would say, he would always say, he'd talk about these situations, he'd say, well, if he wants a battle to the death, I'll give it to him, but it's not going to be my death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the things I felt like when, when he passed away, um, 
I always say this sense, particularly as it relates, and I have an interest in what's going on, even though I'm not a member of the United Methodist Church with the United Methodist Renewal and the, the WCA and the Global Methodist Church and kind of the Pan Wesleyan movement and, and his voice in the confessing movement um, and what he's done for the WCA, all of those things are really powerful. But I, I it, maybe this is just like an emotional concern that I have, but I've always felt like if we had Billy Abraham in the room, we, we had, we had like Michael Jordan, you know, it's like, like we, we have the best player now, rather not, in, rather not, that means like all of the publications stack up at, uh, against somebody else's. I felt like rhetorically we would win. <laughs> like there would be somebody who would, who would defend it. Like, and, and the, maybe it's a bit of a security blanket, but I, I had this confidence in him in part because I experienced it myself in his office. And I, and, and honestly, there was a few times where I thought, you know, I had read um, Larry Wood introduced, I don't know if justice is your case, Larry Wood introduced me to uh, Canon Criteria and I worked way, my way through that. So by the time I got into Billy's office and, you know, I'm like 30 years old trying to, he, and he starts debating with me, I thought, it was, am I wrong? Because he's so convincing and so passionate. And then I saw he was just testing me. Like there was the very first time I got into argument, he's slamming his hands on the table, staring me down. And like, I'm like, what am I, I like, and nobody else is around. What am I supposed to do? Like, I'm, like, I'm, I'm in the wrong place. I've already given money here. And, um, then, and then and then, he just like leaned back. He folded his arms back. I wish I could do an Irish accent, but he just said, you know, it's grand to know you can defend yourself. You know, like he just, yeah. he just wanted to know that I can make it, you know? So yeah. I, I think there's something here what y'all are saying about his ability to con bring context to the educational process. Like where you are, like how he engaged you now as scholars, as people in the discipline, how he engages somebody who is way down the line um, is different. David, you want to talk about that? Somebody like, I mean, you're, you're, you're working with uh, I mean, scholars on a regular basis, like trying to help yeah. people with their teachers. I know what you mean about a sense of security when he was in the room. Whatever room he was in, he was he was normally the smartest guy in the room. Mm -hmm. And he thought with such incredible precision about things. And so for me, Billy was a guy who, I mean, I didn't agree with Billy on everything. Right. <laughs> but at the same time, he kept my theological compass calibrated to true north. Mm. And I could call him and talk to him about theological questions or things I was having, you know, and, and, you know, they always, they, like, I believe that if you're an elder in the church, or ever, really every person in the church needs to be under the spiritual authority of someone else in the church. And for me, that was him. Mm. And so I can't call him now. Yeah. And I can't, you know, I just remember it was just a couple of years ago that you really changed my mind about and we were having a discussion about the difference about the essentially the status of the church's creedal tradition. Is this divine revelation or is this what he would call the sanctified reason of the church? And that conversation really affected the way I thought. And, you know, and, I, and I'm not uh, a neophyte at this work. I mean, I'm I'm getting old and I have been thinking about these things for a long time, but it, I appreciated having him there to help me see when I was missing things mm -hmm. and not having that for me personally is going to be a loss. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But at the same time, it's a loss for the church. It's yeah. a loss for the church. I think Methodism has lost its best thinker. Yeah. I mean, it was the title of your article. Jason, I'll come to you in just a second. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give a link in the show notes to David's article. And I think all of us also reflected on uh, in a firebrand piece too. But was it a titan has fallen? What was it? A, a giant has fallen. It has fallen. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a great way to describe it. Jason. Well, just, and this is, again, just kind of a little footnote on what David was saying there. I mean, I, you were asking about it, it, Billy as a teacher and, and yeah, yeah. you know, I think that he had um, a way of, of approaching people uh, 
whether they were students or you know in some kind of official way or anybody really. Um, and I mean, I think his goal in a way was always to to help people be the 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 best version of themselves. Right. Uh, so if you take say justice, you know, as as a Roman Catholic, you know, uh, you know he's gonna he's gonna work to to try to help you be the best Catholic you can be, um, or, or in that that kind of thing. He, he sort of you didn't have to agree with Billy on everything. Um, it, it, and and the other thing that just quickly comes to mind for me is that you know he always called himself a bog Irishman and. Right. I think that to be from the bogs, you know, for him was this, it was a cultural thing. It was, but it, it, it made him kind of constitutionally uh, drawn to people in the, uh, in the church world, if you will. And, you know, that, that were from similar places, you know, that, that weren't from what he, he might call it high up the candle places, but were yeah. low church or evangelicals, right. fundamentalists, people that were, you know, ridiculed, criticized. And he had a gift for Pentecostals. I mean, right. he was, he was deep for He had a deep personal friendship with Donald Dayton. Uh, yeah. And, and I think it kind of revolved around this a little bit. Dayton sort of being this, uh, person who who really loved and and uh, worked within the holiness and Pentecostal world, um, you know what he called the riffraff, right? And and Billy, you know, I think they connected around that a little bit. And so all that to say, I think he had a, a special gift for um, helping those kind of people, you know, in some cases to find their voice. Uh, to have courage, despite the fact that they might get, you know, ridiculed or whatever. That was just something I noticed about him over the years is he was really good about about that sort of thing. And, and I think it, it had something to do with his cult, his own cultural background uh, from a, a rural town in the north of Ireland. Yeah, for sure. He was just a real master. Yeah. In the classroom, he was he was just absolutely brilliant. I mean, just absolutely brilliant in the classroom. Yeah, I, I can't think. I mean, I can't think of anyone quite like him. He, I remember my, this might have been my second year in the doctoral program. We did a, a, a doctoral seminar on philosophy of religion, and this was the 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 every graduate student in the graduate program in religious studies was in this core seminar together. Which meant there are people you know who are doing you know they're interested in Eastern religions. They're you know just sort of pure critical scholars think. All this theological stuff is a bunch of riffraff, you know. Um, and at the time, you know, he's an analytic philosopher, so he's trained at Oxford in this English tradition, which is about as unfashionable philosophically for these uh, for this this, this circle as yeah. possibly. Be, right? They're all want to read these, you know, French thinkers and right. German stuff. And Billy Billy has no interest in that whatsoever, you know, personally. Um, but I watched him in that class. He he engaged one of my classmates who was like the most avid lover of all things French and critical that I've ever met in a way that brought him on board to the sort of um, discipline of thought. It, it didn't let him get off with any sort of, you know, the very intelligent guy, but didn't let him get by with any sort of trick trickiness that some of these, some of these sort of critical, critical scholars can get by with. Billy wasn't gonna, he's gonna hold him to the fire on that, but he's gonna engage him in a way to guide him into understanding what this other discipline was that he had no respect for before he met Billy, but came to have a deeper, much deeper respect for in the same class. So he would, he invested time uh, in that relationship amidst the class, the same class, um, my, my classmate um, who was, probably our brightest student and was working with Billy at the time would um, David Mahfoud is his name. He, he would, um, he would always want to engage the class because he was several steps down the road with Billy on the topics, you know, cause this was, this is Will house or whatever. And Billy in that class would just constantly, constantly with David would just be like, shh, shh, you know, <laughs> wait, you know, um, you know, he was in control of the classroom. I mean, he was not right. free will classroom he knew what he was doing right. and he was on board and it as a result it enriched the conversation in a much greater way better than any other i i i, I took four of those course seminars and he was the only one who was 
anywhere near successful in that. And he was wildly successful in doing that, I would say. I mean, really a remarkable teacher. It's like he had a, a plot in mind. Like, it, like it, it wasn't just like a course schedule. It was like he was taking somebody on a journey and an and, and inductive journey of discovery. Um, okay, I want to make sure to get a few other things in. Um, and I, maybe we could just hit these kind of like, a, 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 it doesn't deserve, uh, I'm not giving enough credit and time for this, but I'd love to just hit a few of his areas with each of you. And it's, um, and, you know, and some of you have different special specializations in this area, but for instance, let's talk about Wesley studies. So that's what's unique about Billy is here you have an analytic philosopher, right? And in, in, at the same time, he's talking about epistemology. He has this eclectic tradition. He comes in with respect for all kinds of levels of the church and can, can function. Like I could invite him into the Salvation Army to preach a revival and he would do great. I and mean, people would love him. And mm -hmm. at the same time you have like, his kind of, I don't know if you trademark, so to speak, with canonical theism. Um, and then, so we have these various areas. Um, and, and then there's like the kind of practical side. But I'd like to just talk about Wesley studies for a second. What is it that this analytical philosopher, what's his a contribution to Wesley studies? Jason, I'm going to hit you up first with this. I know, like, and I'm not just talking about the fact that he would be somebody who would, like, you know, maybe disagree with others about what the standard sermons are, that kind of thing. But, I mean, what did this philosopher have to bring to Wesley studies? I mean, I think before you know, approaching it from his work in philosophy, I, I think for Billy, there was always a personal commitment to Wesley uh, that just stemmed from the role Wesley played in some of his own early spiritual formation, the sermons especially. So the, there was always a deep commitment there. Um, you know, I heard Billy say a lot over the years that that reading Wesley's sermons at a particular time in his, his life as a student uh, was just very formative for him spiritually. And so I actually think he kind of regarded Wesley as a bit of a spiritual father. Uh, and, and, um, and, so I th and I think over time, that's how he would eventually talk about him. And, you know, he would, he would urge um, Methodists to, to approach him more along those lines than as some kind of, of major theological figure. And of course, he made a, a bunch of waves around that with his end of Wesleyan theology paper. Right. Famous article. Where, where he sort of wants to read Wesley as a saint uh, and, and put him in the canon of saints uh, rather than the canon of, of theologians. And that, of course, is, is a remapping of Wesley or, or a drawing Wesley into Billy's bigger project of, of canonical theism or canon and criterion, all of that work. Those are the, the categories are coming from that work. And, he, and he's locating Wesley or he's beginning to view him that way in the late 90s, early aughts, and then by the mid aughts, by the time he gives that presentation. I've never uh, heard so aughts used like that, but I love it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I've only heard aughts referred to the 20th yeah. century. So I'll, I'm, if Jason Vickers does it, I'm doing it. <laughs> so I, I think that going. that's um, probably the big piece there uh, was, was the move to, to reconceptualize Wesley as a saint. What I can add here is, in, is that um, and, you know, people can decide whether they, they want to believe me or not. You know, um, when it comes to the future, any, any future Methodist church, no, well, two things. Number one, he absolutely thought that Dick Heitzenrotter had the better historical argument in the debate with Odin over the doctrinal standards in the present Methodist church, namely that they do not include Wesley's sermons and notes. Uh, Billy really th thought that that Heitzenrotter actually had the, the better historical argument. Now, whether there are other arguments that might bring sermons and notes back in as doctrinal standards, that's another matter. But uh, with respect to any future Methodist church, he and I talked about this quite a bit, and he was very drawn to the idea of there being kind of a, a, a list of, he liked, he liked lists, right? Canons. He wants lots of canons. Um, and he wants a, a, a canon of works that, that are normative for spiritual direction and formation. And he thought that the sermons belonged there rather than on a list of 
standard doctrines or doctrinal materials where he wanted at the head of that list the Nicene Creed. And then we can, then I think he was open to some options on, say, the Articles of Religion, the Confession of Faith, and what you do with that kind of material. But he certainly thought that, that the sermons, I mean, he, he would be very emphatic about this, that he did not think that Wesley's sermons should be seen as standards of doctrine. Uh, I mean, because especially if one of the functions of doctrinal standards is, you know, as a kind of a, a test of orthodoxy on which, say, clergy could be brought up on charges. So, like, which sermons? And, you know, and, and they just thought it's, that was the crazy. Disagreements they have internally. Yes, and then and then to put it on the same level with the creed, he just thought the, these yeah. are just not the same. This is not the same kind of material. I think he was basically right about that. Now, whether or not people in in any future iteration of the Methodist Church, you know, will actually take those arguments seriously, remains to be seen. Yeah, that's good. Anybody want to add anything on the Wesley study front? I mean, everybody. He made a major contribution to the debate over the um, quadrilateral, of course. Right. Um, another major piece he contributed there that was significant. Yeah. And I think Jason's right, though. That's reading Wesley as ascetic, ascetic theologian. I think that's a term he liked to use, an ascetic theologian, which is sort of a spiritual master like a, like a Abba. And, and while I'm on that, it, with Justice, those of you who you haven't even heard of Billy Abraham until this podcast, and hopefully you hung in there with us this far, but it. I encourage you like to go to his book justice brings up a point and this is like something that fleshes itself out in my denomination pretty regularly people go to the wesleyan quadrilateral quickly and uh inappropriately i'll say and often it moves against the direction of the faith once for all delivered to the saints let's just say and so um billy abraham was a, a fierce advocate against it and his i'll say go to his book waking up from doctrinal amnesia just for a quick summary of where he was or you you could probably even youtube billy abraham wesleyan quadrilateral and get something on that i think you've get a lot of everybody's shaking their head so hopefully if you if you say something i disagree let me know david I, I didn't mean to cut you off there it looked like you're about to say something about wesley studies no i i was gonna say i think that if you read the proposed section one of the discipline for the global methodist church there is no quadrilateral there is no nothing like our theological task in the united methodist book of discipline which i'm quite pleased with amen and, and <laughs> i um i think that that is in a way a tribute to billy's influence upon this movement that to use the quad, especially in the way that it came into the Book of Discipline in 1972 as a way of um, encoding doctrinal pluralism into the life of the church. Um, that was just a devastating, that was a slow acting poison for United Methodism, and we're seeing its effects now. Yeah. But Maybe another I'll find area, that real quick what that it's just a quick outline of what that of how that happens. I alluded to it. And maybe we could just clue people in like a I mean, so so basically, you know, we have the first restrictive rule, which which protects the articles of religion and confession of faith, but they and they, they couldn't do away with these. But what they did was they then put in this section called our theological task with these four resources, scripture, tradition, reason and experience. And they said none of these can be defined unambiguously. And what defines us as Methodists is a commitment to the on and they use the word theologizing so the <laughs> ongoing process of theologizing using these four resources uh with with no not even a nod to the primacy of scripture until 1988. so you use these four resources and and the um the doctrinal standards, the Articles of Religion and Confession of Faith, sort of become landmarks, but they are not standards anymore. And so they, they couldn't get rid of these doctrinal standards, but they undermined them so that they didn't carry any weight in the life of the church. That's what happened in 72. The landmarks in the sense that like the old withered out shell station in an abandoned town in middle of Oklahoma is a landmark, you know. <laughs> Turn left. Yeah. Yeah. A great yeah. analogy, Justice. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, and so Billy understood how damaging that was to the core of Methodist identity and theology. And 
didn't win the day within the United Methodist Church, but I think with the formation of the Global Methodist Church, his influence will be um, quite significant. The other thing I wanted to say, though, about Wesley studies is um, an under I, I, an area that I wish he had written more in is epistemology and Methodism. And I remember reading some things um, that he wrote about epistemology and the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. Yes. For Wesley, this was an important concept, the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, assurance yes. of salvation. And and what did exactly happen to Aldersgate? Right. Philosophically speaking, theologically speaking. And this is an area that I think warrants greater uh, exploration by people who are trained in this area. I mean, this is not my area of training, but someone like Jason or Justice would, would be quite well suited to write about uh, epistemology and the inner witness of the Holy Spirit and to develop um, some particularly Methodist Wesleyan epistemological distinctives. I think that Billy would like that. And I think that he would find that um, helpful for the life of the church. You know, the, the course, little yeah. bits of start to that is that uh, Aldersgate to Athens, the Oxford book. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just so short. It just needs more. It needs more time. But I loved how in that book, he's able to bring in, like, bring Wesley into conversation with Planning Guy and these type of things. Jason, you're smiling a lot there. You want to jump in there? Oh, no, I was just thinking that when you said it was short and needed more time, I, for, for some reason, what popped into my head is that Billy Abraham was the Chris Stapleton of theology, right? Like brilliant, you know, but, but often you kind of go, wait a minute, that song only lasted two minutes. Like, <laughs> you need to finish writing it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I was thinking, you know, one, th one thing that he, he, that's still left to be digested, I think, by the tradition is also, this is related, his work on pneumatology and on ecclesiology which he wrote a lot of, I think, very insightful papers over the last 10 years on those two topics. Um, but I don't think he ever delivered really a, a, a full length um, account of what he was thinking there. It's undergirds a lot of what you see, for instance, in, um, in the four volume set, and especially comes through volume three of his four volume set, I think would, that's, the, that's the book that will, should have a, a long legacy um, that we should we should hope for because that really is a systematic theology and he, lay, he lays out there in that third volume um and some of the key moves there are there but i think that's another area where you know i was just thinking what what part of his his legacy was what were the books i was hoping he'd write someday you know i wanted to read him something write something on the church and something on the on the spirit in an explicit manner yeah it would have been great to have. that's great um any uh, last thoughts on uh no wesley stuff I do want to say that I think um, another contribution he made was he was very concerned to bring Methodism into conversation with a broader canonical tradition of the church. Right. I mean, his whole canonical theism project was, in my opinion, his most distinctive theological contribution. Yeah. Do we all and, agree on that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. Keep going, David. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. And of course, Billy was Methodist to the core. And he was he was an apologist for Methodism, but at the same time he didn't want Methodists to deprive themselves of the riches of the church right. that have come down to us through the centuries. And I think he did feel that in some ways, Protestants in in general, but but also Methodists specifically, impoverish themselves by their refusal to engage with the breadth of the canonical tradition. And he was trying to to help us to see what was there. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's totally right. And I and it it sort of um was something that that in in a few cases even got him into trouble with fellow conservative Methodists, you know, who it I mean it it would it cost him um his his Protestant bona fides. Uh, you know, my my colleague Ken Collins is is a good example of this. I mean, he wrote sure. just a, a scathing kind of critique of the theses that are at the beginning of the canonical theism volume uh, that was either published in the Wesleyan Theological Journal yeah. or the Asbury Theological Journal. I can't remember which one. The right Asbury now. Journal. Uh, the Asbury Journal. And the Billy, Billy wrote a response to it. Um, but but I'm simply bringing that up just to say that, that 
for uh, for many people, uh, the canonical theism project, insofar as it pulled uh, saints and icons and uh, um, you know the the possibility of sacraments beyond baptism and Eucharist. You know the, these kind of things into the conversation, or, or at least asked for them to be taken seriously and considered, um, was just uh, unacceptable. And I, I think there were people that thought Billy had had sort of you know lost his way or should go east. You know should should leave Methodism. He was told on more than one occasion that he should just that he really was no longer a Methodist because of the canonical theism project, um, which, you know, is, um, well, let's just say that, that the, I do think that the canonical theism project could be what you could do if we're talking about unfinished business work that could be done is you could take the basic concepts and categories there and and sort of read the history of Methodism uh, in in the light of those concepts and categories. Who are the saints of the of the Methodist tradition, right, uh, and so forth? I would love to go on further about this, but we're running out of time. I want to give folks a chance to close out a little bit. And you know, I this is this was somebody uh, people in my audience like who who saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. You know, I didn't see myself as a, as a scholar, as a preacher, a Salvation Army officer. And I, you know, I love, I love being, I love being a Salvation Army officer, but he, he kind of used his debating skills on me <laughs> uh, and just pushed me to think in a different way. And, and then, then what kind of, I think is one, the day, one, the day for me was that my own tradition, this, and this goes right along with what you're all saying. So to hear you say this confirms this, had something to offer something offered the broad, like the, the, the Salvation Army in its rough, rugged, gritty tradition had something to offer the wider, not just, not just the evangelical Wesleyan world, but to the church as a whole. And so he was saying, who else is going to do that? And, and you know, Mr. Salvation Army, who else is going to do that? Point at me in my Salvation Army uniform. So like, I'm just, and I, and Jason, you wrote something that it was, it was interesting to me talking about your laugh in the last six months, your time with him. I was, I hadn't heard from him for a while. And then just 24 hours before he died, I had a letter from him. And it was just a sweet letter, kind of reflect on where I am. And then he's, he was going to be doing this project, which I'm disappointed isn't going to happen, where he was going to be doing a paper in D.C., uh, Theological Defense of the United States, which I'm sorry, we don't have time to talk about that. But um. And, and I, it was just a, a sweet way that I was able to have this conclusion to my time with him as, as we experience time right now. Uh, let's, so I'd just like to have folks um, talk about that, uh, talk, just close out maybe on your closing reflections on him and maybe some of your last interactions with him or whatever you'd like to share. Let's give everybody a chance. Jason, you ready? Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, maybe the, the, uh, the thing that is, probably stuck with me the most in terms of my last conversations with Billy um, when he was here at our home in June. Um, he was moving, uh, well, the one thing he had a work he was still planning to do, but but he was moving with, with Grace into a bit of a semi-retirement mode, uh, still working, but um, it was the most relaxed I'd seen him, uh, and and it was actually really enjoyable to see him uh, relaxed and 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 uh, there was just a certain peacefulness about him at the time. The but the thing that that stuck out to me and sticks out to me now uh, was his his commitment to his what I've been calling his missionary teaching. Yeah. And he was very concerned about that, that he said multiple times that week that he couldn't keep doing it all and that some of the rest of us were going to have to pick up some of that work and, and get committed to helping the church in places like Romania and Kazakhstan and Costa Rica. You know, I know David's got a lot of work going on in Cuba and helping down there. And, and in that sense, that's part of Billy's legacy. And I think that if, if Billy um, cared very deeply about anything toward the end of his life, it was the, 
the kind of uh, the, the church, you know, around the world, but especially in places where it was not yet well established, where it was still vulnerable and where it needed good teaching and good training. And I think he was very committed to that he, for decades. Uh, and that's the one thing that I think he, he really was. He was more worried about that in some ways than, than the future of Methodism. Interesting. David, yeah. you have a closing thought? Well, I do agree with this. And I th think that um, for those of us who were formed in such profound ways by Billy, um, the international component is going to be increasingly important. We just can't ignore this. Yeah. And um, the work that he did in Eastern Europe, um, you know, the work that um, he was beginning to do in Costa Rica, uh, this kind of work has to continue. And it's not going to be okay uh, for professors to, to function, for professors in this tradition to function in the way in which we have functioned in the past. I mean, that, that seminaries are now training missionaries uh, to go into post-Christian America and to engage the global church in ways that we haven't had to do before. Um, Billy, the thing about Billy was he could, he was, he was such a rigorous intellect, but he also uh, loved his students. Yeah. And um, he mentored them and he invested, he mentored us and invested in us and gave of his time and shared his life with us. And again, I, you know, I've come to think of my own vocation in a lot of ways, not as simply an imparter of knowledge anymore, but as, but in this role of mentoring people and walking alongside them and helping them to grow up in faith. And a lot of that is because of his example. Yeah. And so um, I miss him. Yeah. I'm still really, really grieving his death. And I wish he was here. Yeah. But I'm so thankful that I knew him. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Thanks for sharing that, David. Justice? I was thinking uh, two things come to my mind. One is, I remember, I think I've told some people this, that the first WCA meeting um, was in Chicago, maybe. And um, I just remember I, I went up there with, you know, a couple of friends for, for a day, maybe. And I remember running into Billy in the hallway. And he really, he really felt as if he had done the kind of gritty work he, he was called to do and his generation was called to do um, to clear the table so that another generation could come along and, and build something. Um, and I think he was, I mean, he was gonna have a say in what he thought that should be, but, but he went, really was at peace at that part of his life. It seemed to me, um, I, his tone from that point forward was different. Um, and so I think that, that was, a, was a huge labor that he, he lived in peace with from that point forward. The other thing was, I, I was just thinking about uh, my last interaction with him in person was the same as Jason's. It was actually at Jason's house. And I remember him, the thing I was just thinking about was just before we went to your house, Jason, uh, that evening, we, um, he gave a presentation to a group of people uh, at Asbury. Oh, and, man. and man, this thing, it was just, it was vintage Billy. I mean, it was, you know, lobbing dynamite here, lobbing dynamite there, you know, and just like firing shots across every, I mean, and it had this, he had this comprehensive vision of how things work and ought to go together and what his constructive vision um, for how theology should be done and what the next step in the thinking through this stuff should be. And he was ready to kind of go to bat, even to the point of, of arguing that Augustine was dead wrong and everyone's been seeing the Augustine Pelagian controversy wrongly uh, since then. I mean, it was that type of stuff that he was not afraid to just kind of jump in and he was still just hammering there. Um, and that's that'll that, that'll always you know that will always live on as kind of a glimpse of of who this this kind of raucous character was in certain yeah. ways. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, he was he was a bull in a china shop uh, intellectually. That's just kind of how he operated. And, and he, he he just he would 
he would just turn up the ground, you know, and just leave leave stuff laying there for other people to come clean up and 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 make good use of, basically, as a mind that he was always doing that. And even at the end, you know, I think he was still just just turning stuff up, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just well, tag yeah, on yeah, one yeah. last thing to to again? I'm going to footnote David here and just say that that I think David's exactly right. That um, of course we miss him, uh, but. You know, the thing I, I, I find myself thinking now, like David, is that, um, you know, one of the great gifts uh, in my life was that I got to be friends with Billy Abraham and he was a blessing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're, we are blessed and, and I'm thankful for you all and the witness that you have in the life of the church and through your own scholarship. We'll try and link as I'll try and link as best I can to some of your works and um, the way God's using you and with gratitude in our hearts for this mentor who took time for us. And maybe as you're listening to this, there's somebody, you know, you, you need to take some time with, um, do it. And we trust that the Holy spirit is at work through this. And, um, with thanks in our hearts for the man that Billy Abraham was, and we look forward to our future with him as well. Thank you all for being with me and joining me on this podcast. God bless you. <laughs>